Okay, class, let's get started. Lots to do before we head out for spring break. Uh, I have a ton to do, so this is not likely. I would love to even get out of here a couple minutes early for spring break, but um, before we do that, we have a lot to talk about. Let's start with a quick review from last class. Last class, here's the big takeaway. Nothing in this universe goes in circles by itself. If you ever see something going in a circle, it's being pushed on. You can take that to the bank. Going in a circle means you're changing your velocity. So even if you're going the same speed, so if you're just driving in a circle at 20 miles an hour over and over and over, that represents a constant change of velocity. Because 20 miles an hour this way is different than 20 miles an hour this way, which is 20, different than 20 miles an hour this way. So if you're driving in a circle at a constant speed, you're constantly changing your velocity because you're constantly changing your direction. If you're constantly changing your velocity, this is a big one, hear this. If you're constantly changing your velocity, that means you're constantly accelerating. If you're constantly accelerating, it means you're constantly experiencing a force. So much of what we've talked about this semester was summed up right in those sentences right there. So if you're going in a circle at a constant speed, that means you're constantly changing your velocity, which means you're constantly accelerating, which means you're constantly experiencing a force. And we even know the direction and magnitude of that force. The direction is centripetal, centripetal. So if you've ever heard the term centripetal, it means center, seeking, to pet means to seek. And so if you are going on a circle, you are, if I'm traveling this way, I'm accelerating this way at right angles, that means I'm gonna go in a circle. And the magnitude, mv squared over r, I don't know if we're ever gonna get to the actual formula, but it goes up with the square of your velocity. So that's worth knowing. So if you take the exit ramp at 20 miles an hour, you need something pushing you centripetally to keep you on that circle. That force is called friction, and you only have so much available to you, mu normal. So your friction coefficient times your normal force. And your normal force is fixed if you're, on, if you're in a car. Yeah, it's pretty much fixed. So if I'm going around, a, if, I'm going around a, the, if I take the exit at 20 miles an hour, I need a force to push me and keep me on that turn. If I take the exit at 40 miles an hour, it takes not twice, but four times. It goes up with a square of the velocity. It takes four times as much force to keep me on the turn. And so if you're ever going around a turn and you feel like you're barely making it before you're flying off into the trees, know that speeding up a tiny bit will make things exponentially worse. So don't do that. Okay. There's your driving tip for the day. Okay. So uh, we went through a few examples. Let's really quickly go through three. I think the simplest example we can talk about is orbit. And the reason the that's the simplest example is because there's only one force acting on an astronaut when he or she is flying around. It's their own weight. So if you're an astronaut and you're anywhere remotely near a planet, you have something called weight. And that's constant, and it's pointed toward the center of the planet. Now, in that picture, all four of those astronauts could be stationary. I could take an astronaut, put them right up there above the North Pole, and let them go. And you can look at their force arrow and pretty well predict what's going to happen. They're going to go. They're going to accelerate in the direction of force. They're going to fall straight down to the planet. That's what would happen if you dropped an astronaut off right there, let him go. He would fall straight down. The only difference between that situation, which is kind of like the Felix Baumgartner situation, he went up into space and then just came straight back down. The only difference between that and most astronauts is most astronauts also have very large tangential or sideways velocity. And so you could take that same situation if all four of those astronauts weren't just stationary, but were going sideways tangent to the circle around the Earth, they were going sideways at about 17,000 miles an hour. They are accelerating down toward the center of the Earth, just like a stationary astronaut, but that acceleration just serves to keep them on the circle, doesn't bring them any closer to the Earth. So in that picture, those astronauts could be headed straight toward the Earth or orbiting the Earth. The only difference between those two situations is sufficient sideways velocity. And anywhere, and, and there's a specific sideways velocity for your specific altitude, 17,000 miles an hour for space station height. A little less than that, you'll just spiral in. You'll very gradually get closer to the Earth. A little greater than that, you'll spiral out into the universe. So we've got these nice specific speeds that we put all our satellites at, and put them in their particular orbits. And we've got low Earth orbit, medium Earth orbit, high Earth orbit, geosynchronous or orbit, stuff like that. Okay. That's the simplest example. Really quick, uh, the Gravitron. 
a little more complicated. And the Gravitron, also watching humans go in a circle, but the difference is the thing that's pushing them in a circle, well, first of all, there's more than one force. So for an astronaut, they just have one force on them, it's their weight, and their weight is the thing that's keeping them going in a circle. For a Gravitron, there is more force involved. I've drawn green arrows for the centripetal force. So if I see a human going in a circle, I know there's something pushing them centripetally. Humans do not go in circles by themselves. For the Gravitron, the thing pushing them in a circle is the wall, the normal force. So the wall at their back is pushing them centripetally. That's the green arrow. If I want the floor to go away, and that's the whole fun part about a Gravitron is the floor drops off and you don't fall. If I want the floor to go away, something needs to balance my weight. So in that diagram, the weight arrows are down. That's all of us. We all have weight. Something needs to cancel that out. Right now, you and I, our weights are canceled out by our seat, by the normal force. But in a Gravitron, physics is turned around a little bit, and I've got something else holding me up, and that's friction between the, the, the uh, parallel force between me and the mat or the wall or whatever you coat a Gravitron with. And so as I spin faster and faster, I mean, you can imagine what that feels like. You've probably seen videos of like back when they used to test, I don't know, they still do this, like NASA, NASA would test their astronauts by flinging them around until they're like, like that. And you can imagine as, as it goes faster and faster and faster, those green arrows are going to get bigger. You're going to have more and more normal force. The more normal force you have, the more friction you have available. And I mean, you only need enough to cancel out your weight. You're not going anywhere. Okay. One more quick example. That was the car going around the loop-de-loop. -loop. A little more complicated than the Gravitron because in this situation, the arrows change direction. So like in the Gravitron, those I, drew, I picked two humans in that picture, and they both have the same deal going on. They've got weight down, friction up, and then centripetal normal force. For the loop-de-loop, -loop, as that driver goes around, things kind of change up on him. So at the top of his arc, his weight, well, his weight is always straight down, so that's the red air. Weight, weight is always down. At the top of his arc, his weight is acting centripetally. His weight is pointed toward the center. That's the only place where weight is centripetal. So it's possible to make it around at just the right speed where at the top, your weight is doing all the centripetal pushing. You don't need anything else. So if he goes at just the right speed, there could be like maybe a little gap at the top even, and then he would just kind of float across that gap. And the, the track wouldn't even have to do anything, or even, wouldn't even have to be there. But that's just at the top. Everywhere else on the, around the loop, his weight is not acting centripetally, so he needs something else. And so you can see that the track, is, the track is circularly shaped, so the track is always pushing centripetally. And so on the left and right sides, his weight is going down. His weight's not helping him at all. He needs something to push him centripetally. That's the track, the, bit, the loop itself. So the loop itself is doing the pushing. And the reason I drew him also down there at the bottom is hopefully you can see that at the bottom, his weight is actually working against him. So, so it's a little similar to uh, the rope swing deal, where when you go around a rope swing, at the bottom of your arc, the rope has to do two things. And in this, in the, for the loop loop at the bottom, it's the same deal. The track at the bottom has to do two things. So the track at the bottom has to support his own weight. So if he was just parked down there, the track would still have to support one car, one car at a couple thousand pounds. But as he speeds up, the track at the bottom has to do more, has to even push not just his weight, that's just to hold him there, but also supply the centripetal force. And so I had that animation of that guy in the longboard that didn't make it because he didn't really think through the idea that once he gets to that, so he's cruising flat, as soon as he gets to the ramp, the ramp's going to have to accelerate him centripetally, and now the ramp's going to have to support his weight plus mv squared over r, his centripetal. Question in the back. Yeah, good question. Does he still have normal? Yeah, I didn't draw a normal force. Um, probably. Probably would experience. So if he were to go crazy fast, his weight wouldn't be sufficient to keep him on that circle. So imagine, imagine at the top, and if he was, so imagine he was going crazy fast, and at the top, the ramp disappeared. He'd go flying off into space. So the ramp is the thing keeping him in. There is a very particular unique speed that he could go just slow enough. So you can imagine um, when I was slinging the wine glass over my head, I was going fast enough that the tray had to be there. The tray was holding the wine glass in. I could slow it down to just 
uh, just the right speed where at the top it, could, it would go slack for just a second. And so you could make a track, you could make a track with a gap at the top, but you, then you'd, you'd have to go the exact right speed where at the top your weight supplied just the right centripetal force. Uh, but if you went any faster than that, you would need extra help because your weight's fixed, your weight's constant. Your weight's constant, your weight's you know, 2,000 pounds per car or whatever. Um, and so you're probably going to want a track just in case you don't go the right speed. Cool. Okay. That's a quick review from last class. Uh, I want to add maybe two new concepts today, then do some fun demos, and then we're done. Who knows? We might get out of here earlier. See how it goes. Okay. Um, we, saw, we saw, I think, last class and two classes ago that hopefully I've convinced you that what we're doing right now is talking about the same old stuff just in a new angular coordinate system. So I've got position, rate of change of position, rate of change of that, and this stuff called shakeability, just the resistance to being accelerated. That's in the linear realm. In the angular realm, same deal. In the angular realm, I've got position, that's measured in radians now, rate of change of that, rate of change of that, and your resistance to being accelerated. Your resistance to being accelerated, we call, I call shakeability, spin of, no, shakeability is in the linear realm, Spinability, your resistance to being spun up. So like this meter stick doesn't, this is kind of hard. This is harder. It doesn't want to be spun up, same mass, but because the farther you are away from the axis of rotation, the harder that gets. Um, one new term I want to introduce today, the analog, the, the angular analog of force. So a force is that thing you apply to accelerate something linearly. If you want to accelerate something angularly, it's called a torque. That's a lowercase tau right there, I guess. A lot of Greek letters in the angular realm. There's a Greek tau. And that is the angular version of force. So if I want to accelerate something linearly, I apply a force. If I want to accelerate something angularly, I apply a torque, which is just another word for twist. So if I, I, a twisting force is a torque. And you can even look at the units and see how you apply a torque. You apply a torque by pushing, that's Newton's, at a distance from the axis of rotation. So here's a picture, here's a picture of me applying some torque. I can't just apply torque by pushing on something. That's not sufficient. I need to be pushing at a distance from the axis of rotation. And even to get a little more particular than that, so here's my bike wheel. My axis of rotation is the handle, right? So here's there. I just applied a torque. It's now spinning. I just accelerated it angularly. I need to, if I want to spin this thing up, I need to apply a force at a distance from the axis. The axis is down here at the hub. I could apply a force. Let's see. I'll push on this spoke right here. I'll push down. That's a nice torque because the torque I applied was the force I pushed times how far away I was. Just to be clear. It doesn't count if I push, if I push pointing at the axis, you can see that. So even though I'm still, my, I'm still applying force a good foot, foot and a half away from the axis, if I push at the axis, my distance is actually zero. So if I, to be technical about it, your line of force, it's really that distance. So like, if I'm, if, if, you know, you can imagine if I push right here, there's a line that goes straight at the axis. I'm actually not applying any torque. And you can imagine, I could push like this all day long, and the wheel's not going to spin. So if you wanted to open a door, or if you had an open door and you wanted to close it, you can't push at the hinge, right? That's not going to close the door. You need to have some distance from the hinge, from the axis of rotation. So the way I apply a torque is I apply a force, and that force has to be applied at some distance from the axis, like that. That's a torque. I don't think I blew anyone's mind there. If you want to get something spinning, you have to apply a, a twist to get it spinning. So what I just did, this thing is at, at rest angularly. I want to accelerate it angularly. I need to apply an angular force or a torque. There's a torque, and as I apply that force, it accelerates. Now it has angular speed. Okay. Good. We're making good progress. Let me get, um, just add one slight complexity to that, or just maybe one situation. A good, a good maybe intermediate example of applying torque is anytime you see a gear or a belt or chain driven system. So there's enough of those in our lives that's worth talking about just for a second. But if you've ever ridden a bike, 
that's what you're doing. You want to get your wheel, this is a bike wheel, in fact. So if I want to ride my bike, I need to apply a torque. I need to get my wheel going. If I was riding a unicycle or an old timey bike, you know, what do they call those, a penny farthing, the big hipster bike with a huge wheel that you ride around on, those, those I'm applying a torque directly to the wheel. And if I want the wheel to go around once, I have to pedal my legs around once. Most bikes are geared, that's the bottom picture. In the bottom picture, I apply a torque. That torque applies a force, that's the green arrow. And you can tell the, the force is my torque divided by that R1 radius. That applies a force on the chain, that's the green arrow, that's a force. That force is transmitted straight to the next gear. If that next gear has a different radius, the torque I get out will be different than the torque I put in. So you can see that it kind of goes from torque to force, force transmitted to the other guy, then force back to torque. That's kind of what's happening when you pedal your bike. Two things to note about that. One, notice in that bottom picture, if I pedal forward, my wheel goes forward. It's in the same, those two wheels are turning in the same direction. It'd be pretty weird to pedal backwards and go forward. That'd be weird. But that's how a bike works, so it's actually it's in the same direction. And you just get this nice, it's just the ratio of the radii. So you get this nice torque transfer. So if I double my radius, I've doubled my torque. If I have my radius, I've halved my torque. You might ask, why would you ever have your radius? Why would you ever want less torque? You get more speed. So you can look at that picture. If I were to pedal R1 one time around, you could see that R2 is going to go more than once around. And again, it's just the ratio of the radii. And so on my mountain bike, I've got, I can select situations where my front wheel is big, my front gear is bigger than the rear gear. That's when I want it to go fast. And I can select my granny gear when my front chain when it ring is really small and my back is huge. And I get a huge amount of torque for just, I only have to apply a little and I can pedal straight up a hill, no problem. That's, that's how bikes work. There's your like 45 second lesson on bikes. Um, gearing is similar. Gearing is the exact same, exact same, almost the exact same thing where really I've just got one wheel or gear and I'm trying to get force and torque applied to the next one. The only difference is with gearing, those two wheels are in direct contact rather than a chain or a belt driven system. They're in direct contact. I still get a nice torque multiplier, either up or down, just ratio of the radii. The only difference being I go in the opposite direction. So you can see that uh, R1 is going clockwise, R2 is going counterclockwise. So in a gearing system, you just have to be aware of that and know that if your engine is going this way, your car is going to go that way. Cool. All right. Any questions so far? Good. I only have to add one more piece to this picture and then we're ready to understand angular momentum. Good. And here's the last piece. That's a lot of, that looks like a lot of Greek letters and equations. Here's the whole point of that slide. Back when we talked about linear momentum, we know we can look at a system. We can look at a system and if there's, if you're not pushing on the system, the system doesn't change momentum. That's what that top line is trying to say. That top line is math speak for, if you don't push on something, it won't change its momentum. That's it. That's what that top line is saying. If you don't push on something, the momentum is conserved. The bottom line is simply saying, if you don't twist something, its angular momentum is conserved. So that actually has some pretty neat applications that we're going to look at today. If there is no torque acting on a system, by the definition of physics, by the rules of, the, of nature, if there is no torque on a system, it won't change its angular momentum. It can't. Okay. So we're going to look at a couple examples of that situation happening. Let's see. I I think I'm going to need a volunteer to show off conservation of angular momentum. All right, thank you. Okay, good. So let's show off a conservation of angular momentum um, using my torque eliminating device up here. So if 
you wouldn't mind, I think you can just sit like, yeah, like that. Just get nice and comfortable. Okay. 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 So this is my spinny chair. The whole point of this spinny chair is to eliminate torque. So, yep, very little torque on that, eh, a little bit, friction. There's very little torque on that system. So if I look at my equation, the whole point, like I said, of that equation is to say, if there's no torque, that's the term on the bottom left, then there can't be any change in angular momentum. That's the term on the far bottom right. So the point of this chair, uh, table thing system is to try to make, try to eliminate torque. So if there's no torque, whatever angular momentum she has, she has to keep. So here's the, going, here's the classic example. I'm going to ask you to hold these guys six pound weights. So hopefully you've been going to the gym, right? Six pound weights. This is, uh, what, I don't know. Zumba, Jamba, what is, I don't know what it's called, Jazzercise. So we're going to hold six pounds weights like this. And so her, and as I've explained before, your moment of inertia, that's capital I, your moment of inertia has to do with the square of how far away the weight is or the mass is. So if you do this, you've really changed your moment of inertia, capital I, a lot. And then I'm going to give her some angular momentum, so you'll be spinning, okay? And once you're spinning, and then I'm just going to ask you to pull these guys in. And if there's no torque, there can't be change in angular momentum. So the angular momentum of the system has to stay the same. If I goes down, omega, which is her speed, has to go up in order to keep the total momentum of the system constant. Let's give it a shot. Okay. Okay, so you're out like that. You have a large moment of inertia right now. You have a large moment of inertia. And then, so then bring them in. Okay, yeah. And yeah, yeah you, you'll start if you're, if they're, if your weight's not over, kind of over the axis rotation, you kind of, you'll, you'll kind of go around like that. Let's try it one more time. So, okay, actually, yeah, right now, if you just put them out, you should slow down. Okay, that was nice. Okay, let's try that again. So we're going to speed up, speed up, speed up, speed up, speed up, and then, right, there it goes. And then you can put it back out, and you'll slow down. Very nice. And then back in. Okay, awesome. Thanks. Okay, good. And hopefully, I should have asked, I need a volunteer that doesn't get car sick. I hope that, I hope that worked out. Okay. Now you're going to tip over on your way back. Okay, good. Okay, yes. Yeah, round of applause. Um, good question. Just so a quick review. What we just saw is no torque means no change in I omega. I is moment of inertia or spinability. I is moment of inertia or spinability. And that goes up with the square of how far away these are. That goes up with the square. And then omega is radians per second, angular speed. It's angular velocity, so how fast you're going around. So if you are, yeah, so that, that product of i times omega has to be constant. And so if i goes up, omega has to go down. If i goes down, omega has to go up. They have to, there has to be an even trade-off. So if you have your moment of inertia, you're going to double your omega. Any questions? OK, let's, let's do one more. Can I get another volunteer? And this one, I'll, I'll, I'll give the caveat that you probably should be OK spinning. Yes, please, come on down. OK. Same deal, just grab a seat. OK, we're going to look at a pretty similar pretty similar setup. What was your name again? Logan. Track team? OK. I should have gotten you to do something where you have to run around. There's going to be no running. Sorry. OK, Logan is on the track team. Uh, we're going to have a pretty similar situation. I'm going to ask you to hold the bike tire like this. OK. So right now, the Logan wheel system has no, mo no angular momentum. And so right now, if I do this, OK, actually, yeah, we're going to have to, uh, we're gonna have to add one more little bit of knowledge here. So right now, the Logan wheel system has angular momentum, right? Let's give it, actually, let's, go, let's have it go this way. This, the Logan wheel system has angular momentum right now. It's this way. Here's how we're going to define 
what I right now am calling this way. I want everyone to, to, to hear this. What we do is, here's how we define what this way, the direction of this way. We take our right hand and we make our fingers go around the direction of the spin and our thumb points in the direction of angular momentum. So right now, the Logan wheel system has a large, or not very large, now it's large, upward pointing angular momentum. The angular momentum of this system is up right now. Okay, so there's a big, there's a big capital L, that's angular momentum, up right now. And in a second, I'm gonna ask him to flip it over. When he flips it over, the angular momentum is gonna go from up to down. That constitutes a large change. Say it was 10 up. If it goes from 10 up to 10 down, that's a change of 20. But there's no torque because he's sitting on my special stool. So if the whole system has up 10 and it experiences a downward change of 20, something has to go up 20 to make up for the difference. Here's what's going to go up 20, the whole system. So what we should see is the whole system will start rotating to make up for the change. Cool? All right, let's try it. And to make sure you're going crazy fast, I'm going to put this on the grinder. Okay. 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 That's pretty good. Okay. So I'm going to hand it to you. It's going to be one way, and then you're going to you're going to flip it around, right? Okay. Okay. So right now he's stationary. Now to flip it one flip it one way. It doesn't matter. Keep going all the way around, all the way upside down. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. Try, okay. So try it again. So uh, it actually helps if one hand is, yeah, one yeah like that. Okay. Ready? And then flip all the way around. Keep it going. Keep it going. Keep it going. Keep it going. Yeah. So there it is. Okay. Nice. And now flip it the other way. There. So what you're seeing right here, I guess I can turn this off. So what you're seeing right here, and then let's do one more time. Big flip. There, by the way. There it is. Nice. Awesome. Okay. Thank you very much. And let's see. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. OK. So what you're seeing is initially, I gave Logan a large, again, I want us to understand the whole right hand rule thing just so we can keep di uh, the directions and keep track of the direction. So I gave Logan a large up momentum. So he's sitting here with a big up momentum. So the Logan wheel chair system has a big up momentum. If the Logan wheelchair system doesn't have any force on it, or torque, more specifically, doesn't have any torque on it, the Logan wheelchair system has to keep an up momentum. So let's call it up of, like I said, up of 10. So when Logan does this, it's now negative 10. Something has to make up for that, because you're not allowed to have any change, because there's no torque. I can do this if my feet are on the floor. That's no problem. I can change it, because I'm, I, I have lots, I am applying a torque to this system. But if I don't have a torque to the system, I do that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna start spinning. My whole system is gonna start spinning. Oh, and by the way, a second, I just I forgot another way to do that. If I wanted to, if and uh, yeah, if I wanted to start spinning right now, here's one one way I can do it. I can right now my whole system has a momentum of zero, an angular momentum of zero. If I want to start spinning this way, it's kind of like. It's kind of like the rocket ship. If a rocket ship wants to go that way, they throw something that way. I can actually, if I want to go this way, I can just spin something that way. And you can see my whole system spins. So I can actually get myself spinning by applying a torque internally to the system. So I can get this whole system spinning by inside the system getting something spinning up. Cool? OK. Let's do an eye clicker real quick.
Okay, so here's the question. So right there, there's a picture of your ice skater spinning around with arms out. Ice skater brings her arms in. She speeds up. That green upward arrow is not her angular momentum because her angular momentum stays constant. That up arrow is her angular velocity. I want to know, did that take any work? Or wait, rephrase that. Where did she, so she's going to get extra en kinetic energy, I should say that. So that green upward arrow is her angular speed. So she's, that's her speed. It goes up. Her speed increases. We saw that. Speed increases. Where does that extra kinetic energy come from? Where does she get extra kinetic energy? So A, she doesn't get any kinetic energy because energy cannot be created or destroyed. B, she does work pulling her arms in. C, kinetic energy is actually constant. Or D, the ice that she's skating on. There's 240 people enrolled in this class. I'm hoping we get 120 answers today. It would be pretty good. We're up to 103. Yes. Pardon? The definition of kinetic energy, I would say, is energy of motion or speed, including angular, including angular, which we haven't talked about before. Hey, 129, 130. Oh, this is great. All right, take 10 more seconds. Okay. So as she pulls her arms in, the thing that stays constant because there's no torque, the thing that stays constant is her angular momentum, I times omega. But because kinetic energy has to do with omega squared, so I think we might remember that the formula for kinetic energy is one half mv squared. Same with angular. In the angular realm, kinetic energy goes up with the square of your speed. So I omega is constant. One half I omega squared is not. Kinetic energy does, in fact, increase. Somebody did work. She actually had to do work on herself. The answer is B. Uh, did it? You actually had to apply some effort to do that. And so when you're spinning around, you can imagine if you're spinning around, the weights are kind of flung outward. So pulling those weights in actually takes effort. And so she actually did work on her own system. And so your kinetic energy went up. You actually had to do work. You had to expend some breakfast just to pull those weights in. OK. All right, one more example. One more example. And <clears throat> I did want to leave uh, some time for this one because it's a little bit complicated. Uh, so let's, let's walk through the physics of this last example, then uh, we'll call it a day. And I'm going to get my wheel again. Okay, so I now have my wheel suspended from the ceiling. Now let's take a let's take a look at the situation. Right now, here's the physics of the situation. If I were to hold the wheel up like this right now, if I were to hold the wheel up right now, there is a torque that I if I were to let go, I guess I should say that. If I were to let go right now, this thing would swing down. The reason it's going to swing down is there's a torque being applied to the system. Here's my axis of rotation right here, where the rope is attached. Okay. Yeah. Here's where, here's where the, the axis of rotation, right here where the rope is attached. That's where it's going to rotate about. The torque is coming from the fact that this thing has weight. So this thing has weight. That weight is a, is a we can treat the weight as uh, acting at the center of the wheel. So there's a torque. Torque was, is force times distance. So the force, the weight of the wheel, times this distance between where the weight is, about here and here, about a foot. That torque is going to angularly accelerate the system. So here's an example of a torque angularly accelerating a system. Like you might, I mean, I don't think I have to explain. I could have asked you what's going to happen when I let go, and you predict that's going to flop down. 
I just want to be a little bit technical about what's hap why that's happening. The reason it's happening is there's a torque about an axis of rotation. Right here where the rope is attached is an axis of rotation. And the torque is the weight of the wheel, and that torque is going to accelerate this thing angularly. It's going to accelerate it about the axis of rotation. So I'm going to see angular speed. Okay, So that's what's going on. I'm going, I've got a wheel attached like this. When I let go, I see angular speed. I see angular acceleration. Now I can change the situation just a little bit by spinning the wheel. I'm going to get it going nice and fast. So if I'm spinning the wheel, things, things change a little bit. Let's get that going a little faster here. That's pretty good. OK. So similar deal. So right now, I have, I have an axis of rotation, and I have weight, just like before. So I have a weight that is applying a torque. That force is acting at a distance. But when I let go, it doesn't flop. It doesn't flop at all. There's no flopping going on. So I expected maybe the same thing to happen that happened last time. So it's, it's the same wheel, same axis of rotation right here. But when I let go, there's a torque. There's definitely a torque. That hasn't changed. There's still an axis of rotation. There's still weight. But when I let go, it doesn't flop at all, which is a little bit weird. It's a little bit weird. But we already know the physics, actually. We already know the physics behind what's going on there. Let's see if I can get that to, there it goes. So just like, just like last time, there is a torque being applied, but, there's, but there is a slight difference. And so let's go back to that whole, the direction of the, of the angular momentum. Whoa. So actually, this is kind of crazy. Um, so the system just picked itself back up. That was cool. That was cool. I didn't expect that. So the system has, has this angular momentum right now. And so right now, it's pretty large when it's vertical. But then it can actually turn that angular momentum. That's crazy. OK, I like that. All right, and then I can just kind of put it back where I wanted it there. That's kind of where I wanted it. OK, stay. All right. So like I said, we already know the, the physics of what's going on here. Let's look at it uh, briefly. And that is, so back when, like when Logan was up here, I explained that I can, I can describe the angular momentum of this system using my right hand. So right now, the angular momentum of this system is pointed at you guys. So you can imagine a large arrow pointing along the axis, pointing right at you guys. So there's a large, I don't know, green arrow or something pointing axial at you guys. That's, I'm going to go back to my equations. My equations, I think, I don't want to get too into equations, but my equations help a little bit. So I'm going to go back to the equations. That, that arrow, that arrow is capital L. That arrow is capital L. So if I spin this thing this way, Right now, let's spin it this way. Let's. I spin it this way. I've got a big capital L arrow pointing at you guys. Just like last time, just like before, when I let go, there's a torque. The torque is just just the same torque that causes this thing to flip this way. That torque. That torque. Well, let's see. If I hold it this way, the torque is out of you guys. So I'll say that. So right now, the torque is at you guys. The flop. That's pointed at you guys. So the way I'm holding the wheel right now, when I let go. There will be a change in angular momentum pointed at you guys, the way I'm holding the wheel right now. Okay, So right now, I'm, there's a force acting down. There's an axis of rotation. So when I let go, there's going to be a change in angular momentum pointed at you guys. And that's what you see. You see it flop down. You see a system do that. Everyone got that? So you're seeing that happen. There it goes. Flop. <laughs> pointed at you guys. Now, if I get this thing spinning, there's a large angular momentum pointed out the door. So when I flop it, when it flops, the change in angular momentum goes from pointing out the door to pointing at you guys to that's what's steering it around. That's why it's processing around. Is you're watching that same change. If it's stationary, a small at you guys torque looks like this. But if it's spinning, a small, a small torque, a small change in angular momentum pointing at you guys is just going to push that big green arrow around. So there, imagine there's a big green arrow pointing out of here. 
this is just going to, the torque is actually just pushing it around and causing that green arrow to go from this way to this way to this way. And that's why the whole system precesses around, because the torque of the weight of the wheel times the axis, this axis, this distance, that torque is doing just what it did before, giving it some angular, giving it an angular uh, momentum, a changing its angular momentum. Torque times time changes angular momentum. That's always true. It just manifests itself differently if the system already has a very large angular momentum. Cool. Here's a picture of what I just said. I don't know if the picture will help, but here's a picture. There it is. So <clears throat> that red arrow down to the left, that's the angular momentum it had before I let go. It, added, it had this big arrow. When I let go, the torque applied gave it that little delta L on the left. That little delta L on the left just caught, changed the arrow from this way to that way. And then the torque is still there because it still has weight. That changes it this way, this way, this way. And the big, that red arrow just kind of sweeps through the room as torque pushes it around. So let's try it one more time just because that's fun. And I think. I'll do it one more time, then I think we're done. Not yet, because I do want to talk about this briefly one more time, just so we can see it. So right now, the angular momentum, right now the angular momentum is pointed at the door. It's pointed at the door, because it's going this way. It's pointed at the door. So the torque caused by the weight will, will push that angular momentum push it around. That's that little delta L you're seeing there. And that's why you're seeing it precess around. Yikes. OK. And this rope is so long, I get these other effects. But that works pretty well. OK. And I get bouncing. OK, any questions? OK, happy spring break. Uh, we'll see you next Monday after next. <laughs>